Thank you for joining us today for a webinar on cow's milk protein allergy in babies. What is it and how to manage it? I am Ranjit Dangel, VP of Education and Engagement at Food Allergy Canada. And our guest speakers today are Dr. Julia Upton and Ahuva Magder. Cow's milk allergy is one of the more common food allergies in children. When it appears in infancy, it may be referred to as cow's milk protein allergy or CMPA. This term CMPA often means a type of cow's milk allergy which has signs and symptoms that may look different than the typical IgE mediated food allergies. Regardless, these symptoms need to, be need to be addressed for both the health of babies and breastfeeding moms. It's a bit confusing, which is why we are covering this topic today, to help parents, dietitians, and other healthcare professionals understand CMPA, how it's defined and how it's different from an IgE mediated allergy. Along with its diagnosis and management and implications for both babies and breastfeeding moms, we're delighted to have two experts with us to share their information and insight on this condition. Before I introduce our two guests, I wanted to note a few housekeeping items. This session is for informational purposes only and will not provide specific medical advice, recommendations, diagnosis, or treatment. Please do speak to your doctor about any concerns or questions you may have regarding your own health or the health your child. Everyone but the speakers are muted so we can keep the audio clear. If you have any questions during the session, you can put them in the chat question box at any time. We will try to get to as many as we can at the end. And, and lastly, this webinar will be recorded and shared on foodallergycanada.ca afterwards. Now I'd like to introduce our two guest speakers. Dr. Julia Upton is an allergist on staff at the Hospital for Sick Children in the Immunology and Allergy Department and is an Associate Professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Toronto. She is a past Section Chair of the Anaphylaxis and Food Allergy Section of the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. Dr. Upton is also a member of the Healthcare Advisory Board for Food Allergy Canada. We also have Ahuva Magder with us today. She is a registered dietitian who manages a private practice with a special focus on pediatric health and also supports community pediatric clinics. She has previously worked as the clinical research dietitian in the food allergy program at the Hospital for Sick Children. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Upton and her presentation will be followed by the Hoovas. There we go. Thank you so much, Ranjit. It's a pleasure to be here today and thank you for the amazing turnout, everyone. This is great. So we're going to talk about cow's milk protein allergy. I'm hoping that in this session we'll learn about allergies to cow's milk, the diagnosis of cow's milk protein allergy, what is the treatment and the management of the CMPA, and so what food avoidance is needed, when is it resolved, any other conditions to watch out for, and the role of the allergist. And exactly like Ranjit described, um, and we'll go through that briefly, that in this presentation we're going to focus on the non-IgE type of Just firstly, milk is an excellent source of protein and calcium and multiple vitamins. And so an allergy to milk can have a significant nutritional impact. And so it's always um, important to just think about the good things about milk when we're also thinking about the allergies that we can have to milk. And just that it really is a complex food that we have to think carefully about if it is avoided. So the symptoms of cow's milk protein allergy. I'll go through two cases just to illustrate how different this can look. So imagine a six-year-old girl, the 10 minutes after eating yogurt for the very first time, she has cough, wheeze, hives, and vomiting. And imagine a different case where a six-month-old girl, she is breastfed and she's recently started formula supplementation and she has vomiting and diarrhea. She's thought to have an infection and she goes to the hospital, she improves over a couple of days. And then when they reinstate her formula diet, when she's about to be discharged, she develops severe vomiting and severe diarrhea. So both of these are examples of children with cow's milk protein allergy, but they were very, very different symptoms. One was immediate, kind of wheezing and highs, and the other one was more delayed, kind of looked like a gastrointestinal illness or infection. 
So cow's milk allergy is thought to be quite common. And, you know, so some, some sources list that up to, you know, 14 or 15 percent of kids have cow's milk protein. However, when it's formally assessed and formally tested or challenged, meaning that, you know, the child is, is examined and, and given the milk, it's actually much lower than that. And, you know, why is that? Well, it's such a common food in children's diets and, you know, kids can be confusing. They have lots of different symptoms. They have lots of different feeding issues. And so sometimes the, the cow's milk um, you know, comes out as the item that people think could be the cause, but it, it often is not. Having said that, you know, 1%, even 2%, you know, um, somewhere around there, like this is, this is an allergy that a reasonable proportion of children have, and it is one of the most common allergies in most countries uh, in infants and young children. So probably not as common as we think, but it definitely exists and it's definitely one of the more common uh, food allergies. So cow's milk protein allergy, uh, in terms of the diagnosis, is an immune response to the cow's milk protein components. And we know that it goes away if the allergen is removed from the diet. So the symptoms will go away. But if we give it again, then, then the reaction will happen. So in those two examples that I gave, the person who had wheezing and hives, we, those would resolve without being, without being fed milk um, products. And then if we gave milk again, it would happen again. And same thing with that example that I gave of the more gastrointestinal reaction, that it went away when it was removed and given back, and, and, and it came back when it was given again. Um, so this term, DMPA really means, as we can see on this screen, means cow's milk protein allergy. And I almost want to say that most of us use the term CMPA when we mean that more gastrointestinal picture, the one I gave in the second case example. But it really depends. You can read an article. I know most of this audience is dietitians today. You can read an article that's about CMPA, and it means the wheezing, hives, um, you know, blood pressure, uh, immediate vomiting type reaction, the IgE mediated reaction. And other times you can read an article, and this CMPA article is totally focused on the non IgE type. So uh, I will say that within certainly within most people that I converse with, and I, and I asked around before this presentation, usually the term, maybe I'll say in this area, or perhaps even in Canada, the term CMPA often does mean non-IG. I guess I would just make sure that if you are reading something, just check, because it isn't consistent. It really isn't consistent how people use this term. And there's no real reason that it should only be non-IGE. I just think for whatever reason, people tend to say milk allergy if they mean IGE media, and they say CMPA when they mean these non-IGE ones. So again, just to make sure we're all on the same page, the IGE mediated milk allergies would be an immune system reaction to cow's milk. The symptoms would happen within minutes to a few hours. And it's called IgE mediated because it's thought to mostly be due to a type of antibody in the blood called IgE. And I think this audience is quite familiar with the classic signs of an IgE reaction, which have, there's a picture there. And that was the first case that we touched base about. Whereas the non IgE mediated, it's also immunological. It's really is thought to be the, an immune system reaction to cow's milk, but we don't really understand the pathway. It's different than the IgE mediated pathway, but we don't completely understand it. It's mostly gastrointestinal symptoms. It can be delayed by hours. And because of that delay, it can be difficult uh, to make that association between the cow's milk and the reaction. So if there's a child that is having you know, feeding problems, um, diarrhea, failure to thrive, these kinds of symptoms, you know, some of the questions that parents will be asked is what happened when there was this reaction, like why are you worried about milk? When did the reaction first start? How long did it last? What kinds of treatments were used? How was the growth? Are there other feeding changes? What's the feeding history? And do other family members have allergies? So those are, you know, often the questions that we start with. How do we diagnose non-IgE-mediated CMPA? 
if we are worried that this might be the cause. So there's three different types of these non-IgE mediated food allergies uh, that are within this gastrointestinal um, sphere. There are other very unusual reactions that you can have to cow's milk that we won't, we won't speak about today. But when we're focused on the non-IgE mediated GI type symptoms, then th these are the three that we are typically discussing. So there's the dietary food protein enterocolitis syndrome, otherwise known as FIs. There's the dietary food protein induced enteropathy, and that looks a bit like celiac disease, but it's due to milk. And then there's the dietary food protein induced proctocolitis, and that's a well baby that just has a bit of blood in the stool and mucus. So the next slide. I just have all three of these together so that we can go through them. So FIs are the sick ones. That was the case that I gave at the beginning. FIs is an infant that presents with profuse vomiting and diarrhea. They can be dehydrated. They can be very sick. People often, when this first happens, it's often thought to be a viral illness. And that story that I gave at the beginning is not that uncommon, that it's thought to be a viral illness. They recover with some IV fluids, you know, maybe even they're given antibiotics and then they're ready to go, formulas reintroduced and it happens again. So that's somewhat obvious, although the delay in symptoms can make it tough. And the thing is that you can also have chronic FIs where if there was a much um, smaller amount of milk uh, that's sort of routinely and chronically in the diet, then it can be a little less obvious. Um, they can have more uh, subtle symptoms like regurgitation, diarrhea, failure to thrive, low albumin. So um, again, though, you know, and we'll talk about it a bit later, if you were to stop the milk and then reintroduce it, then, then you would expect to have the acute FIs, just like I gave in that second example, meaning again, that they would have the vomit and diarrhea. So from the enterocolitis, Again, it's an infant. These, these children, again, present more like, almost like celiac disease in that they have a malabsorption syndrome, malnutrition, they're not gaining weight from. Rarely they can have bloody stools, but it's not the characteristic. And the lab tests show low albumin, that they're losing protein. And then in the proctocolitis, these are the well kids. These are the kids that have, um, they're happy, um, chubby, growing well, they look good but they do have some blood mixed with mucus in otherwise normal foods. And if it's not clear, then, you know, the um, occult blood testing can, can pick that up as well. But usually it's visible blood. And they can actually become anemic due to the blood loss, but they otherwise look good. So I just note that constipation is really not a symptom that, um, is part of these uh, non-IgE mediated gastrointestinal food allergies to cow's milk. So FPIs would not present with constipation. FPIs really is this profuse vomiting and diarrhea. It's like the body is trying to get rid of the food. And in the more chronic state, it's uh, again, still diarrhea is really the expected symptom as well as failure to thrive. Regurgitation is a bit different. You know, that can be part of chronic FIs, but typically not in isolation. Now, proctocolitis, it is controversial whether a well baby with constipation and a bit of blood intermixed with the stool, whether that might be um, sort of a version of this CMPA proctocolitis presentation. Um, my point is that really constipation is, milk is not, milk allergy should not be the, the first thing that we think about. Um, and it would be a controversial presentation of only the mildness of these syndromes. So as I've been saying, this can be hard to figure out. So although it's an immune response to one or more cow's milk proteins and it resolves if the allergen is removed and it's reproducible, it can be difficult to, um, to actually figure this out when there's so many other things that, that can be going on in the baby. 
And as an allergist, it's really hard to, to, to accept, and it, but it's true that the allergy tests do not show these types of gastrointestinal problems. We, we will not pick this up. And, and when we think again of that, that second case that I gave of a baby with such pronounced symptoms, you know, he eats or the, the girl eats the milk and has that profuse vomiting and diarrhea, it's remarkable to think that the tests don't show it. And not only do these tests not show it, so the allergy skin prick tests don't show it, but we don't have any tests that can show it. So um, allergy skin prick tests like, in, like are in this picture are really to be detecting that IgE antibody. And because this is a non-IgE style of allergy, they just, they're just they not contributory for diagnosis. Now, having said that, we do often test these kids. And the reason we test the, the more severe ones, the more f pies presentation of children is because some of them do have positive tests. And so when we see that, even though they have a clear f pies, then we do worry that they'll have a longer time of it, you know, they'll resolve at a later age. And we worry that, uh, that they are at a larger risk of actually developing IgE mediated allergy, meaning the type of anaphylactic allergy. So many of the new guidelines do recommend that allergists do do skin prick testing to look for uh, specific IgE to milk, not so much for the diagnosis of FPIs, but more to risk profile and to think about the child's risk of going on to develop but the diagnosis really rests in the clinical history. So again, they all resolve if you take the, the milk away, cow's milk away. And so when we're hearing the F pies story, if the family can clearly give us two clear examples, then that's enough for diagnosis. And really more than anything, these are clinical diagnoses. The enterocolitis can be a little bit harder to put together because this is a you know a baby with failure to thrive, low albumin, malabsorption syndrome. So they often get a workup, and it may be the biopsy that helps to confirm that this is thought to be enterocolitis, as well as the response to avoiding intact cow's milk. And then the proctocolitis, again, you know, often this is one of the first line interventions in a well baby with blood in the stool. Often they're told to you know avoid the intact. Um, uh, milk, cow's milk, and if that resolves, then that's quite straightforward. Uh, if it doesn't, then we need to think about other causes. So again, these can be hard to figure out. So what's the expected time of improvement? I mean, you know, in general, three to five days for patients with immediate reactions should be more than enough. A couple weeks, though, for delayed reactions, and the longest time that you may need to, to wait to see improvement would be for those intro malabsorption, but not sort of an acute syndrome. And really, if no improvement is noted in a few weeks, then CMQ is really good. So sometimes physicians deliberately feed a baby milk under medical supervision to find out if it's the milk. Uh, typically, this is actually done when, it's, when, when we're trying to assess if this CMPA has been outgrown. Um, so we're usually doing it to try to normalize the diet again and move forward. But in situations where it's very unclear, then sometimes we do it to actually cinch the diagnosis. So what happens with this? Uh, so if somebody has F pies, again, if we were to di directly and deliberately feed them milk, then we would expect vomiting, tired, pale in the one to two hours after feeding, and diarrhea in a few hours after that. Whereas enterocolitis, we would expect vomiting and diarrhea in about 40 to 72 hours. This is so a more obvious syndrome if you stop the milk and then reintroduce it. And then the proctocolitis, we would expect rectal bleeding in six to 72 hours. Again, we don't do this very commonly. Usually we can make a reasonable diagnosis by the um, clinical history. So the management of cow's milk protein allergy, these non-IgE ones, I just wanted to put this up and um, uh, prove our, the dietitian will speak more about this, but really, you know, pediatric care is really key. Growth, weight, development, how are they doing is um, one of the mainstays of treatment. And we wanted to do a poll, what you're probably more interested in. <laughs> so 
Uh, the poll question that's up on your screen right now says, asks, does an infant with DMPA require their breastfeeding mother to avoid all sources of dairy? So if you could just take a couple of seconds to answer that. So we've got 55% of people said yes, 26% said no, and 19% um, have unsure. Perfect, excellent, thank you so much. Okay, so let's talk about that, which food avoidance is needed. So in an infant with CMPA, um, we, we do want to support breastfeeding. The, and then there's, there are alternatives to breastfeeding. So some, sometimes the baby that you meet is, is no longer breastfeeding. You know, they, they require formula. And Ahuva will, will speak more about the formulas. But just, just to think about them here, in terms of infant, the main source of infant nutrition is, is either breast milk or formula. And so the extensively hydrolyzed formulas are milk that, well, extensively hydrolyzed milk formula or cow's milk formula is milk that's been broken down into small proteins by enzyme. And this is actually usually tolerated by, by infants that have CMPA. 10 to 20% do not. And for those kids, they need a diet that really doesn't have any trace of the milk in it. And that's where the amino acid formulas come in. And so it, for a formula fit infant. So the amino acid formulas have never seen milk. They're, they're made of the building blocks of protein. And then soy is commonly a trigger. It has a high level of cross-reactivity, probably somewhere around 50% with cow's milk. So we don't, we, don't, we don't go to soy as an alternative to cow's milk if you need a formula. So it's extensively hydrolyzed formula. Most of the kids can eat. And if not, then amino acid if you need a formula. So I just wanted to show that. And then let's think about supporting breastfeeding again. So Often the story for, for babies with CMPA is that the issues happened after either um, milk-based solid foods were introduced or that milk-based formulas were introduced. And so when we think of that, of the fact that in a formula, in a milk formula fed baby, the first line that works for most kids is actually to just switch to extensively hydrolyzed milk-based formula. It's not an absolute complete total avoidance of any milk-based protein. It's this, the, the, this extensively hydrolyzed one where they've taken the milk and broken it up. So when we think about supporting breastfeeding, some of it comes down to, so we can definitely support breastfeeding, but in terms of what maternal elimination diet is required, you know, if there's a very clear history that these GI reactions in the baby happened after the introduction of intact milk in their diet, then the mom may not need to have such um, uh, complete and total milk avoidance. And so I just wanted to have this slide there for a minute to just really think about that. Because, you know, if we were only using formula, we would be using a formula that's broken down milk. And so when, again, just to say it, when the story is that the child reacted to intact milk, then you know, removing the intact milk from the child's diet is of course essential, but whether that needs to go along to avoiding it from the maternal breastfeeding is more controversial. And in fact, people are, are beginning to move away from that, except in the most severe of situations. So milk protein is found in nanogram quantities in breast milk. And actually the evidence for maternal exclusion diets is low. And, and yet it has significant nutritional risk as well as psychological um, concern uh, about you know, the mom having to be so strict and worrying about the milk that she produces. So, we, where it is this coming from then? So most of the articles and most of the experts um, that write about CMPA talk about consider maternal elimination in exclusively breastfed. So if there was an infant that had FPIs or had enterocolitis when in an exclusively breastfed, then you know if we think that's milk, then the only source of milk is from the breastfeeding. But it's a different situation if that baby was fine until they started to introduce milk, intact milk in the diet. So I hope that distinction is there. 
And so there's some new articles, you know, essentially saying, listen to the mother, you know, what, what, what is their story? When was the problem? What, when were the problems that started? What did they observe? What did they see? Um, because we definitely want to have collaborative decision making with the mother and, and not um, create a situation where they're not uh, trusting in, in their body or their observation. So how do we know when this is resolved? So many children with non-IgE mediated FIs will outgrow their allergy in a few years of age. And so often because proctocolitis is so mild, often um, physicians recommend around 12 to 20 uh, to 24 months after the last reaction, then we try. Um, I, I, sorry, for, for FIs, we often try around one um, yes, sorry. <laughs> so around one year for proctocolitis. So that's the well babies, we often try around one year, and then about 12 to 24 months after the last reaction for the more serious ones for f or for the enteropathy. And how to try this again has not been you know, really well studied in lots of different arms of how should it be done. But what, what, um, what many practice is that if the symptoms were not severe, then start introducing. So, uh, so for proctocolitis, for example, well, baby, little bit of blood in the stool. So after one year, you can start reintroducing for add an ounce a day of intact milk to whatever it is that they're already eating and look for symptoms. You know, if on the other hand, the baby was being managed at this point with an amino acid formula, let's kind of step back and let's try the extensively hydrolyzed milk formula first. And then if, if they tolerate that, then we can try intact milk protein. And of course, if this was very severe, if we had a severe f pies history where it was you know, dehydration, lethargy, vomiting, diarrhea, then that type of introduction would be medically supervised. Plus those are the ones that we'd really wanna make sure before we reintroduce that they haven't developed an, another type of allergy, the IgE mediated type of allergy. So, you know, with this reintroduction, this prolonged avoidance, especially in an atopic child, can lead to IgE-mediated allergy. So that's a picture of a pearl there, meaning a clinical pearl, and allergists can test prior to reintroduction. So what is the role of the allergist? So diagnosis, but it's clinical. And so, um, you know, the, um, we don't have a test. It's really more listening to the story and ruling out other things. So in testing for other conditions, many of these kids are atopic otherwise. Many of them have eczema or asthma or other uh, conditions that the risk assessment, like we discussed, if that testing is positive, if the IgE, if the skin prick testing is positive in, uh, in a baby with f -pies, it does make us think, ooh, you know, we'll probably try a bit later for that reintroduction and we'll probably do it medically supervised, or we would do it medically supervised. And then management of other atopic conditions, the dietary recommendations. And to just recap those, uh, if, if this is a formula fed infant, it's extensively hydrolyzed milk formula first, not soy. And then if that doesn't work, it's amino acid. And then reintroduction planning. And we don't typically prescribe an auto, an epinephrine auto injector. And that's because this is not the type of reaction that epinephrine helps with. Now, can we prevent this? So early introduction of cow's milk, many of this audience would know, really likely reduces IgE-mediated milk allergy. There isn't a lot of data for this for the non-IgE. It's an easy slide. Hopefully, we'll learn more about that in coming years. So my take-home points, I hope, are that non-IgE-mediated CMPA, cow's milk protein allergy, is a clinical diagnosis. It's usually an infant. They have predominantly GI symptoms. It's managed with really good infant follow-up. Avoidance of intact cow's milk and soy. Extensively hydrolyzed milk formulas are usually tolerated. Avoid unnecessary avoidances. If the story doesn't support that you need to avoid that, then, then you don't need to avoid it. And you can always, if, if, if we're not in a, you know, if we have really good follow-up and the child's not unwell, you can refine the avoidances. Reintroduction approach and timing and location is really based on the severity. So we do hope that in the future, there'll be better diagnostic methods. There is uh, interest in the A to P patch test where they put like a patch of milk, kind of looks like a nitroglycerin patch, but it's milk. And they, um, the investigators want to see 
does that predict symptoms at all. Uh, where there's also hopefully there'll be better blood tests, which we do not have for this condition. Further refine how strict the avoidance is. You know, so do these kids tolerate baked milk? So meaning can they eat muffins and waffles? You know, once once that's a sort of natural part of the diet. And, and to really refine and be more consistent about advice around maternal elimination diets during breastfeeding to give better uh, advice to everyone. And then there's a growing and emerging role of medication. Uh, there's a medication called Ondansetron that's often used for vomiting. And uh, this is, is starting to be used in equines. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So well, we'll pass it over to you. So thank you. So um, so it's now we are going to turn a bit to the dietary management of cow milk protein allergy. Um, and we are going to talk about a couple of different topics. Number one is the infants under the age of one. Uh, so you know, specifically, how do we manage infants who are diagnosed with cow milk protein allergy? What the nutritional implications are of that? Uh, as Dr. Upton said, how to support breastfeeding, choosing formula alternatives, um, and really what the nutrition needs are of breastfeeding parents. And then considering as the ch as children cross you know, one year of age and older, what some of the nutritional implications of that are, how to choose proper cow milk alternatives above the age of one and replacing uh, the nutrients of concern. And then as well, how dietitians can support uh, children with cow's milk protein allergy. So there's generally two ways where, you know, in my practice and dietitians would become involved with children with cow milk protein allergy. One, and as Dr. Arvin said, this is less common, is working with breastfeeding uh, mothers if and when there is a reaction through the breast milk. So in infants under four months of age, and then as well starting and assessing infants around the four to five month mark when there might be a reaction to cow's milk, either with the introduction of formula, if you know they are supplementing or combination feeding, and or the introduction of cow's milk through solids. <clears throat> and so when infants, when we are assessing infants with cow milk protein allergy, in addition to you know, taking a proper history um, and full assessment is we need to consider number one, uh, the growth of the infant. So, you know, in as in Dr. Upton's uh, example with, you know, there being quite severe vomiting, diarrhea, has there been any growth faltering? Is there any failure to thrive? Uh, have they have these infants been crossing any percentiles as well as considering any blood work? Is there a chance of anemia? Uh, what are some of those considerations? What are the current methods of feeding? So is the child currently breastfed? Is the child currently formula fed? Has there been a combination of both? And as well, and we'll talk about this, uh, you know, a little bit uh, later, what is the future planning? What is that looking like for the parents in terms of their planning for the future of feeding? If, if the child is being breastfed, is that something they want to continue? And if it is particularly an infant in the first four months of life where there would need to be some dietary modifications made, uh, do the parents fully understand you know, what all of those implications are and what those changes would need to be? And then as we introduce you know, some uh, combination, some um, complementary foods and start transitioning to solids, planning for a dairy-free, soy-free alternatives while introducing solids. And I think that it's always important for us to consider that, you know, breast milk or formula are the primary sources of nutrition, the exclusive sources of nutrition up to the age of four or five months, and then still the most important sources of nutrition for these children under the age of one. So choosing the appropriate alternative has quite significant uh, implications for these children. So if if parents are breastfeeding, mothers should definitely be encouraged to do so if they are able to and do want to. Um, and you know, as Julie was saying, they should uh, you know, get clear guidance as to whether they do or do not and often do not need to completely eliminate dairy from their diet. Um, if they do need to eliminate dairy from their diet, we do need to consider their own intake of calcium. We do know there's evidence that you know, while, while mothers are breastfeeding, there is, they do experience slightly lower bone density. Bones do, do contribute much of, of the calcium that is used to, um, to supplement in breast milk. And so we wanna make sure that they are achieving their own calcium needs by having two to three calcium rich uh, alternatives per day and or choosing to supplement if that is not possible. 
And you're recognizing that dairy and soy containing foods can provide convenient uh, and healthy sources of protein and calories for these parents. So, you know, as Julia was saying, it can have significant implications if they do need to eliminate, they do need to consider not only ensuring, uh, you know, that they are meeting all of these nutrient needs, but also how that can be done in, you know, what many and, you know, myself can experience as a challenging, you know, postpartum time. And so working with a professional, uh, whether it's a dietitian, uh, being able to track, you know, their own um, weight, energy levels, all of those, you know, kind of factors in how we can best support mothers to then be able to support their infants as well. It is really important for parents as well who have maybe never had the experience of reading food labels, whether it is, you know, eventually for choosing complementary foods or for mothers eliminating milk in their own diets to recognize that, you know, priority allergens like milk need to be included in Canada within either the ingredients list. So, you know, as you can see um, on the left, there is listed milk in the ingredients list or in the contained statements of most of all foods. The bigger challenges for a lot of families in, uh, includes things like takeout foods, uh, places where food might be prepared outside the home where you might not have as clear of a sense uh, as to you know what might be in those foods. The recommendation would obviously be to not eat those foods, but again, just to give a sense of how you know these this can complicate um, the diet of a breastfeeding mother if you know any of those foods uh, that might be prepared outside the home are not able to uh, be consumed as well. So the first choice for formulas, if infants are going to be formula exclusively formula fed, or we are using any formula to supplement, would be extensively hydrolyzed formula. So as Julia said, those are those are produced by breaking down cow's milk protein to a size that can be tolerated by most infants with uh, CMPA. They are the first choice that we that we use for these infants. They're number one. They're often most more cost effective than amino acid based formulas, and there is thought to be a benefit to children uh, still remaining exposed to cow's milk protein in any way that they can still be um, exposed to them, which they would be with these extensively hydrolyzed formulas. Um, some infants, as Julia said, would still uh, react to the extensively hydrolyzed formulas, in which case we would need to choose an amino acid-based formulas. That is only around 10 to 20% of infants who we would need to use these amino acid-based formulas, which are made of the building blocks of protein, so have absolutely no cow's milk of any kind. So there is uh, that lowest risk of reaction uh, than the extensively hydrolyzed formula, but we don't still get that exposure to uh, the cow's milk protein in these uh, when we are choosing these um, these formulas as well. The nutrition uh, or the nutrients of concern while we are adding the complementary foods for children with, with cow milk protein allergy are the same as uh, children without cow milk protein allergy, but we do need to, to pay some specific consideration to how we achieve these needs under the age of one. We actually don't need to introduce any sources of uh, calcium, so any dairy or non-dairy sources of calcium to infants under the age of one. The needs for calcium but for the ages between seven months to 12 years of age is 260 milligrams per day. Uh, as you can see, you know, formulas, uh, and that is that counts for the extensively hydrolyzed formulas and the amino acid-based formulas as well, is around 90 milligrams for, per five ounces of prepared fluid um, fluid uh, formula. So we do generally meet the needs of, for calcium from either breast milk or formula. Um, we do need to consider, especially if there is any risk of iron deficiency in these infants, uh, making sure they're getting uh, their sources of protein and iron, particularly if they are breastfed infants who uh, do need to start iron rich foods at six months of age and introducing healthy sources of fat. So cheese, yogurt, those are things that can often be introduced in children with not without cow milk protein as healthy source, uh, allergy as, as healthy sources of fat under the age of 12 months when it is particularly important. So ensuring that we are exposing children with cow milk protein allergy to the non-dairy and soy-free sources of fat as well. And then as with uh, all other infants, supplementing with vitamin D uh, 400 international units daily. 
So when we are transitioning to children one year of age and older, solid foods are becoming the most important sources of nutrition with, uh, with uh, breast milk still playing an important role if parents do want to continue breastfeeding. We should transition from formula, so we're no longer looking at replacing formulas. We are looking at solid food becoming the primary source of nutrition, continuing breastfeeding if desired, and then replacing the nutrients of concern that we might get from cow's milk in a dairy-free and dairy-free alternatives. So cow's milk is quite a convenient source. It's like a nice little you know, bundle of many different nutrients. But it is always important to communicate to parents that it is a convenient source of the nutrients, but we definitely can achieve all of all of these infants' nutrition needs from looking at both cow milk alternatives and whole foods to provide the nutrition that children need for healthy growth. What's always important, so you know, just in in how uh, I want to be able to to share this slide, it's always important when we're looking at cow milk alternatives to recognize that not every alternative is going to have the exact same nutrient profile that we might expect from its its cow milk containing counterpart, right? So just to sort of look at it, if we compare the cow's milk on the on the top line per two hundred and fifty milliliters, we have three hundred milligrams of calcium, which is every other cow's milk alternative is fortified to generally around that same mark. But to compare the almond milk that we see in the third line, when we're comparing the protein from eight grams of protein versus one gram of protein, uh, fat eight grams of protein to zero grams of protein. If we're looking at the So Delicious coconut yogurt, uh, again, you know, for the 150 grams that we might, uh, that we would be having, we're having less than one gram of protein and five grams of fat. If we were to have a uh, regular you know cow milk full fat yogurt we would expect to have around seven grams of protein for that same for that same serving size and around eight grams of fat and again this is just to sort of bring the importance of we're not only going to some of these cow's milk alternatives when we're thinking about how we're going to supplement and how we are going to create this balanced diet it's always just important for practitioners and for parents to be aware that when we are choosing our alternatives being mindful of, okay, you know, what have we already supplemented? What have we already achieved in using this cow's milk alternative? And maybe where do we need to still pay specific attention? So again, if it's slightly lower in protein, how can we, you know, achieve that somewhere else in the diet? And as well, uh, making sure that we are achieving healthy sources of fat through other foods that we are choosing as well. So why don't we use nut milks under the age of two? Um, and, you know, these these items are you know, readily available and many parents do uh, wish to use them. We don't recommend using nut milks under the age of two because fat is quite an important substrate in the diet for growth and particularly brain development, which happens rapidly under the age of two. As you can see in the previous slide, when we're looking at the almond milk, there is no fat in that, that cup of almond milk and it is quite low in protein as well. And so because you know, it is, is lower in the fat, we don't necessarily want to choose that. Um, it's also significantly lower in calories than other, than other foods. So if we, again, compare uh, something like a cow's milk, which would have around 130 calories for one cup, most nut milks, as particularly almond milks, would have around 30 calories. So they're significantly lower in calories for that same cup of milk. When they are higher in calories, it's normally the sweetened varieties. It's normally from added sugar. And again, under the age of two, added sugar can displace energy from other sources. And so we don't want to be adding those calories specifically from added sugar. Um, I almost like to think of the nut milks almost like just a liquid calcium supplement. Um, and so, you know, if parents are using them already, just being mindful that that is, that you know, we're not getting very much added nutrition other than the calcium that we are getting from these milks um, and we sh they should be that we can choose other milk sources that are higher in fat and protein as well. So when we are also uh, using cow's milk alternatives I think that it's incredibly important to be mindful that we do need to get in the, these calcium alternatives we do want to ensure that these are happening throughout the day, but we do also need to be mindful of the fact that, you know, having calcium throughout the entire day can limit uh, the absorption of other 
of other important nutrients of concern, particularly iron. Uh, calcium and iron can compete for absorption, and so we do want to consider the timing of how often we are off, we are making these foods available. So making sure that we are only ever uh, offering calcium uh, cow's milk alternatives with meals or snack, and keeping water between meals choosing two to three times in the day. So again, knowing that we're gonna want two to three servings of calcium rich foods for, for children over the age of one, choosing two to three times in the day where those foods would be available and maybe one to two times in the day where those foods are not offered. And we pay particular attention to serving iron rich foods um, and other varieties of foods. And then also considering alternate forms or uses. I know that for many parents, it can be very stressful if um, if children are not readily, you know, accepting these new uh, these new cow's milk alternatives, so just to drink them. So considering alternate uses, like you know, when we're preparing oatmeal or things like rice, or how can we achieve these foods in the diet, in cooking, or in how we're preparing food, so that we don't only have to have it um, served in a glass as well. So again, you know, just on this slide, I do want to to reiterate. So these are the most common nutrients that we would find in cow's milk. We can achieve these, you know, all of these nutrition needs, both in combining cow's milk alternatives and in a variety of whole foods in creating a balanced diet. So again, cow's milk is a very convenient source of these nutrients, but you know, parents should know that it is possible to achieve a balanced diet without including cow's milk in their infant's diet. And how can dish dietitians support? So dietitians can work with parents uh, and children in addressing their nutrition needs and the nutrition needs of their infants to raise healthy eaters, support parents in, address in addressing other nut uh, nutrition issues. So you know what happens if, if children are refusing some of these alternatives, how to manage uh, avoiding these foods while still maintaining a balanced diet, um, and any other you know, toddler nutrition challenges that can come up. Collaborate with other healthcare practitioners, such as the pediatricians or allergists, for a well-rounded support, and then support reintroduction uh, if, when that is made appropriate. So, just you know, to recap, cow's milk protein can have significant nutrition implications for both infants and for breastfeeding mothers. Extensively hydrolyzed formula, if they are formula feeding, is the first choice for infants, and amino acid-based formulas are only used in children who react to extensively hydrolyzed formulas. Complementary foods should be added as appropriate with special consideration to some of the nutrients that we would uh, you know, not be getting in avoiding that cow's milk. And then after the age of one, milk can provide a convenient source of many nutrients and appropriate cow's milk alternatives and whole foods uh, should be used to bridge that gap. Thank you, Ahuga. Um, thank you both actually for the very informative presentations. There were a lot of questions at registration along with several that were submitted during the session. So we'll go through as many as we can now. I'm going to turn on my webcam and ask both uh, Dr. Upton and Ahuga if you can also do the same so everybody can see us. Great, um, so we'll just jump right in. Um, this first one is for Dr. Upton. A question came through during the session on symptoms specifically, mm -hmm. does enterocolitis always present with vomiting or can it be just diarrhea? Yeah, so it's a, that's a great question. So the FPIs, what we think of as sort of the, the worst of the CMPAs, the non-IgE deviated CMPAs, can have quite a uh, wide spectrum. So some of them really look very, very sick, like as if they have an infection. But, you know, they others, if it's chronic FPIs, where they're just sort of getting a little bit of it and it's all the time, they, they can have less obvious symptoms. And so um, I would say that, yes, they, they can present like you described. And that's what's so difficult because we have no testing for it. And um, it does tend to be a pretty frontline intervention to just try, you know, if, if formula has just been, if a milk-based formula has just been introduced, to, to think about whether that is playing a role and, and to try, uh, you know, eliminating cow's milk, uh, intact cow's milk for some time and, and, you know, a few weeks and see if it makes a difference. And if it doesn't resolve, then, then you know, the child probably needs more advanced investigation. 
But, you know, I know that's a non-satisfying answer, but the problem is it really is a clinical diagnosis. And so, you know, we need to start with suspicion, which your question obviously demonstrates. And then there isn't any testing to know other than listening to the story, the timing of when the cow's milk was introduced, the exposure to cow's milk, and then what happens when you avoid it and what happens when you bring it back. And, and we often don't do the bringing it back if the rest answered the question. Are there, um, are there also some atypical symptoms of CMPA? Like, so, I mean, I mentioned, you know, that, that, that constipation would be a, would be a controversial one, um, you know, but in, in general, you know, it, in general, they fit in those, in those three buckets, you know, that you're either, you're either a baby with the regurgitation, vomiting, diarrhea, you're a baby with malnutrition, low albumin, or you're a baby with um, very well, baby, with blood, mucus, and the stool. I mean, those are the three. But yes, I mean, you know, there's no, there's no physician that will ever say that there is, <laughs> you can't have atypical presentations. But I think what I'm trying to get across is that it's, it's rarer than you think. You know, in the sense that yes, it's common in that it's maybe one or two percent, but, but it's not fifteen percent. And, um, and so. Yes, we want to suspect it, but we also don't want to sort of blame cow's milk for everything. And if we're not sure, then then we're stopping, seeing if it made a difference. If it didn't make a difference, then bring it back. You know what I mean? Because as allergists, we're so concerned now about prolonged avoidance and atopic kids. So, um, you know, and again, I know that's unsatisfying. Believe me, I wish we had tests that could answer the question. We don't. So all we have is this clinical information that can try to help us to put the pieces together. Well, along with that uh, question just came up about uh, infants being diagnosed with CMPA due to reflux. So, um, yeah, didn't really you know, I mean, chronic FPIs has been described, you know, with, um, you know, sort of a predominant regurgitation, but, you know, usually you would expect that they would have um, some diarrhea as well. Uh, the you know, again, you would hate if you if you remove the intact milk protein, you know, if you switch to an extensively hydrolyzed formula and there's no difference, then you need to rethink the diagnosis. Um, and so it, it can be, but I mean, it's it, it's a good question. It can be, but you would like to see more. Um, but if you're not sure, then, then trialing it in and out, like for something like regurgitation, that wouldn't be something you would be so worried to stop and then, you know, and then potentially bring back, right? So um it's uh it's it's possible but we don't want to overdiagnose it either and if we make an intervention like stopping it if it didn't work then bring the milk back mm -hmm. okay well let's switch gears to breastfeeding this one's also for you dr upton does, does breastfeeding need to stop for diagnosis and if so for how long one of the questions that came through um was with parents being told to stop breastfeeding for diagnosis some moms told no breastfeeding for three months can you advise on this and how breastfeeding can be protected? Absolutely. So for the breastfeeding, and this is controversial, and you know, you may notice in the talk, I never gave the, the right answer for the poll that I asked. So why? Because I put it in as uh, for something for us to really think about and to discuss. So the advice of stopping breastfeeding, I would suggest to you is not really, um, uh, it, that, that, I mean, you never want to say never, but I mean, that should be in extraordinarily unusual circumstances, because if you have symptoms of CMPA and the, and the child was exclusively breastfed, then what you would do is ask the mother to avoid milk, um, you know, and milk products like dairy products to see, is that the cause? Is that milk protein that's coming through the breast milk? You know, more commonly, the story is that these symptoms begin when intact milk is introduced, either through supplemental formula or through solid food feeding. So I'm struggling to think of a situation that asking a mother to stop breastfeeding for three months would, would be the way to move forward. <laughs> Okay. So I, well, along I, I'll go and say I, I would not advise that other than, you know, I, I would need a, 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 a different reason than CMPA for that. And I hope that makes sense. And what I'm trying to show is that, you know, when you think that if you, if, if you know the child has CMPA, we know that 90% of them tolerate the broken down milk. We know that very little milk comes through the breast, through the, the breast milk. 
and and we know that it has very significant ramifications to do that and so you know that really it should be I can't think of any reason to tell them I'm to stop breastfeeding and then even to do the maternal elimination diet. We just want to be cautious about it if it's really obvious that it's linked to intact milk rather than you know, if the child was thriving prior to that, then, you know, if, if, if it's nutritionally reasonable to to do to keep the breastfeeding, then, then keep it. I mean, it, you know, so I, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, that ties into there was some confusion around when to uh, remove dairy from the diet from a mom's point of view. So a question had come in about um, that confusion around CMPA not being common for exclusively breastfed babies under four months. So this parent, she's experienced this with her two-month-old and she knows five other moms who've experienced it. Then they're all told to eliminate dairy from the diet. So I'm not sure if she can talk very quickly about when dairy would be recommended to be removed and when it's not. Yeah, so in that situation, and of course, this this audience and the national audience will have, you know, this population that has had that happen to them for sure. And so if there's no other reason, so if it's an exclusively breastfed infant and, the, and there's a question of is the intact milk coming through or is the milk coming through from the breast milk, then if maternal diet excludes breast milk and the child improves, then, you know, that is currently the management. I did hint at some papers that are coming out now that, that, that do wonder, you know, um, exactly exactly what's happening there. Because it's, it is very difficult because we have no tests and because, um, you know, they, it's just, it, it's very difficult to make the link conclusively unless there's a clear resolution when you remove the milk and, and a clear worsening, which we often don't do when you bring back the milk. So um, if that was the experience that there was a maternal full elimination diet and the child got better within a few weeks, then of course that would make sense to continue. What I'm highlighting is that if you have a child that reacted to something like yogurt um, and, we're, sup and we're, we're successfully supplementing with extensively hydrolyzed formula, it just may not make, and the child was fine when was being breastfed, it may not make as much sense to be having a, a very, very strict elimination diet for the mother. Okay, that's really helpful. Bahuva, we did have a question on the dietitian's role in managing mm -hmm. allergies. And when you would suggest seeing an allergist, um, and then specifically it came through during the session, when should dietitians suggest the physician refer to an allergist for a CMPA? Um, so, I mean, dietitians, in managing children with with food allergies might either see them you know pre or, or post diagnosis of cmpa i see you know both infants who are just being introduced to solids um i always encourage uh, parents to uh, i mean i have great relationships with a lot of pediatricians and allergists uh, in the city so um i always encourage parents when we are introducing any solids to just pay special note to you know are they seeing any signs and symptoms? Can they go even onto, I know you guys have some great resources and being aware of what they are even looking for. Um, so both in supporting infant parents in how do we properly introduce these allergens if they're not yet introduced. And then again, you know, if they are already diagnosed, how do we then manage them? Um, I always encourage parents if there is, if there's anything that parents are gonna feel hesitation about serving again, Right, because sometimes I think that parents, you know, if they serve, whether it's when in the case of dairy or whether it's any other allergen, if they're, you know, I'm just really nervous about it, I'm going to hold off on serving it again. I always think that it's a great, I then do often rec make the recommendation of why don't you reach out to your pediatrician and and see if there is any reason to possibly, you know, refer to um, an allergist because I think that it's always, you know, important to be able to support these parents in, we don't want there to be any apprehension. We don't want there to be any, you know, nerves around serving these, these uh, allergens. And we do want to make sure that they are in as early as possible. Um, I encourage parents as well, always to be able to take any pictures that is, that are, are, and or can be relevant. Obviously it's not the same thing as, as, you know, CMPA, but I have an 11 month old. When I introduced him to dairy for the first time, he got, you know, red, all, I was like clicking my iPhone, like, you know, like every single picture I could possibly get to just send because it's always helpful to be able to have 
uh, you know, especially when nerves can be high and they are for parents very often when they are introducing these foods to their children to be able to have a clear story on, you know, sort of what happened um, so that, you know, I can work collaboratively, you know, with their pediatrician who can make a referral onto an allergist if need be. Uh, and then, you know, we can have the proper management, uh, you know, organized. And then Uhuva, how do you help parents transition their infant to a hydrolyzed formula? What are some tips and advice on how to prevent the baby from rejecting the new formula? So I think that it is, you know, important to recognize that some infants might reject it, you know, to begin with, right? It is a new taste. It's something new that we are introducing. If you are breastfeeding at all and you can, uh, like if it is sort of a combination that we can be doing, it can be helpful um, to be able to, you know, even do like if you're, let's say, preparing a four ounce bottle, three ounces of breast milk, one ounce of the extensively hydrolyzed formula, and then continue increasing um, up to, you know, up to a full bottle, let's say, of the extensively hydrolyzed formula as they get used to the taste. I think that it's also important just to be able to manage the, the parental expectations of what that's going to look like, right? When you start a bottle of a new formula that has a new, you know, a new taste, everything is different their infant might not down, you know, the same amount if you were using a, a full cow's milk a formula and, you know, they were, let's say, taking six ounces in a bottle. For those first couple of times, there might be a lower intake just because they are getting used to it. Um, so introducing slowly, we can use titrating um, you know, if possible. And then just recognizing that, you know, that intake might be a little bit lower for those first couple of days as you're introducing it. Okay, great. Uh, this question came in through chat um, just now, Dr. Afton. You noted that with children that are on amino acid-based formulas, that they, they should be introduced to extensively hydrolyzed formula before being exposed to the intact cow's milk protein. Uh, there was a parent that was instructed not to introduce cow's milk dairy to her daughter before one year. Would she then introduce something like Elementum that is hydrolyzed first after one year of age? So what I would... Um... So specifically what I was talking about there is when we're ready to ask the question, has this child outgrown the CMPA? The, um, and again, there's no, there's no studies on exactly how to do it. So this is just, you know, sort of maybe good housekeeping advice is what some people think makes sense, is that if a child is now doing well and thriving on an amino acid-based formula, Rather than going straight to trying some yogurt once we're ready to move forward, what some advise is that we first try extensively hydrolyzed formula and see if they tolerate that now. Because in an ideal world, the child that's on an amino acid formula is only on it because they fail the extensively hydrolyzed formula, you know, when that was made as the first choice, or they had a very severe reaction and was um, and was given the amino acid formula. So I'm not saying that that's how everybody does it, and you certainly wouldn't do it on your own. What if the child was very severe? Then you know, usually this will be medically supervised. This um, this checking: can we now reduce some of these avoidances? Can we avoid the avoidances or not? And um, you know, I can tell you that in our practice, we do tend to um, we tend for a very severe child with FPIs, then we would tend to test them. And then we would just try around 12 to 24 months after the last reaction, and we would try just regular milk. But it is an interesting idea to go from, rather than just going straight, to almost almost like a step down. Of, well, let's see if extensively hydrolyzed formula is now tolerated, and then, okay, well, if that's tolerated, then let's take that last step forward. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's an approach that, that might make sense. The other way that it may make sense more on um, um, these, like if a child, for example, had food the, the food protein induced proctocolitis. So was a well baby with blood in the stool, was tried on extensively hydrolyzed formula, still had blood in the stool, and now is on amino acid. Then, you know, step that back after a year to the extensively hydrolyzed, see if they tolerate that now. And that is something that could likely be done, you know, more, um, you know, more on a, a home basis, you know, in, with uh, the direction of your, the family physician or the pediatrician or even the dietitian. So I think it's, it's it's more these are ways to kind of begin removing the avoidance. And you don't just sort of one day try it. And so uh, certainly for the milder kids, where after a few years they're they're trying it at home, then then often you'd be directed to be mixing in this little bit, just like um, Ahuka mentioned. So I, I hope 
I hope that makes sense. I'm not advising to just try that, you know, on, on your own. <laughs> okay. Um, and we'll ask, we jump into soy because there were a few questions about soy. Um, so Dr. Upton, how common is it for babies with CMPH also have sensitivity or allergies to soy and what guidance should be given received regarding soy? Should they avoid dairy and soy? Yeah, so it's about 50%. And so, you know, as I alluded to in the first part of the presentation, honestly, this can be a confusing condition, not just for parents, but for doctors. And so, you know, usually the advice is you avoid milk and soy. If I had a very clear history that the child is known to tolerate soy, you know, if for whatever reason they've been on a soy formula for a month and we're perfectly happy and thriving, and it's just the introduction of the cow's milk protein that has caused these issues, then that would be a different situation. But that's not typically the story. The typical story, just because of the way we tend to introduce foods, is that we don't know what happens with soy, and we do know what happened with milk, and therefore we just tell you to avoid milk and soy. So, you know, I never want to go against something that you have personally observed and you know to be true. And so if a family told me, my kid is fine with soy, this happened, you know, when I did this, we would listen to that. But the, the statistical chance is 50-50. So if I meet a baby that hasn't fried soy and clearly has f 5 to milk, I'm not going to tell them to eat soy because I don't want them to have f 5 to soy. We'd rather just avoid it, deal with the milk. And if the f 5 to milk, when that is gone, then the dietary restrictions are gone. That, that's usually how we do it. Knowing that there are some kids with multiple f 5 and we didn't get into that because this is predominantly about milk. But, you know, this audience will know that there are some kids with f to multiple foods, not just this cross-reactive situation, but there are some kids with multiple foods. And that, you know, that, that becomes, uh, of course, more difficult to manage. Um, so I, I hope that answered the question. It's about a 50% cross-reactivity. If we knew it was tolerated for sure, we'd say okay, but usually we don't know that, so we say it works. Okay. And then, uh, well, you have this as our last question. There's still so many more questions. I think that's telling with probably needs to be another session on this topic. Um, so Ohuba, uh, there's a few questions that came in about goat's milk. Can goat's milk be an alternative to cow's milk? So goat milk would have the same proteins that cow's milk would, so we would not um, we would not serve it. And I know there was a question as well that came through about the A2 uh, milks, which would, uh, part of the, some of the proteins have been, have been removed in those uh, A2 milks, but they still do still have the majority of the same proteins that cow's milk would, and so those would not be okay alternatives. Okay. Yeah, we, we commonly state about a 90% cross-reactivity between the other mammalian milks, um, and um, you know, one special circumstance may be camel's milk, um, you know, but I think uh, in North America we're just learning about that, but in general the goat's milk, uh, sheep's milk, we consider them, um, you know, they're they're about a ninety percent cross reactivity with cow's milk. That's great to know. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for the extra time that you both have so generously given to us uh, today. Um, feel free to turn off your webcams now, um, and we'll quickly just jump into the last few slides of this session. Um, so, as next steps, uh, as a reminder. You will get a short survey through GoToWebinar immediately after the session um, that will pop up on the screen. You'll also receive the same survey in an email. So please do take a moment to complete it. Um, we we'll also are going to be doing uh, another session next week in terms of COVID-19 vaccines and food allergy. Uh, it's going to be on the 25th. So please join us as we discuss the vaccine for children under 12 years of age with an esteemed panel of experts. Registration is now open at foodallergycanada.ca, so it's definitely a session not to be missed. And we'd also like to thank the sponsor of this session, uh, Reckitt Mead Johnson Nutrition. Thank you so much for joining us today. You can view a recording of this webinar at foodallergycanada.ca shortly. Look out for an email coming to you within the next week or so with a direct link to the recording. And you'll also have a recorded version of this webinar with French subtitles coming soon as well. So it'll be available um, um, more broadly. This now concludes the webinar. Thank you so much for joining us.